If you're not careful, you start calling your fellow countrymen the enemy. Most people have been in the Gulf Wars who have been in uniform. They have been in the Middle East somehow. And if they come back to the United States and they start looking at uh, folks who are of Iraqi descent or, or um, Iranian descent or something like that, they call them enemy. That develops a psychological viewpoint they have of this uh, individual. An enemy, that word enemy, means you can't rest. You'll have no peace until that enemy is gone. It's like a trigger word that everybody understands. And if you demonize somebody or call somebody an enemy, you're going to develop that psychological profile in your head that you can have no peace, your family can have no peace until that person or that type of person is gone. When this country was formed, it was away from a monarchy. They were establishing democracy, such ideas. Then all of a sudden, they began to deal with troubles, and it somewhat spoiled the blessing. Now, on occasion... People were sent to reignite that idea of how blessed we are to have this nation. On occasion, we had global war, and the people who fought that global war, because it was a lot of them, came back over here and they said, all I want is peace. I don't want any war. I don't want conflict. I don't want anything. After they came back here because they didn't want the conflict, they started sowing seeds of peace. And by the time the 80s came around, everybody was enjoying life. Things became lucrative. So lucrative that many people began to get money in their hands and the lifestyles of most people went up. Ideas were born again. The future was bright. Trouble started again in the country. It seems when you have all the freedom in the world, corruption comes. Opposition comes from within. If you're sitting around your house and it's perfectly clean and you think you're going to relax one day, something takes place to steal your joy. You know it's true. So you can take a perfect environment and it's always going to be ruined by some odd happening, some weird thing. In your freedom, you're attacked. In your freedom, sometimes we get so complacent. We forget about the blessings and everything else and we begin to complain until it's all taken away. And when it's all taken away, it's a shock. Because what we have a tendency to do in our freedom is not fight for one another, not look out for one another. But we tend to take everything into ourselves. We tend to establish our own worlds, each and every citizen. And we begin to compete and to fight where no fight should be had. Then when things don't work out, or if something, if you intrude into my bubble, or I intrude into your bubble, you find somebody else who's had somebody else intrude in their bubble. Now you have a conversation about your fellow countrymen. See, the point I'm making here, guys, is that we have forgot that we're countrymen, haven't we? That we all live in the same house. Right now, today in America, families live in homes, but each room is like a different nation. The parents don't go in the children's room. The children don't go near the parents. Nobody goes and hardly anybody goes. They were they, they had gotten to the point before COVID-19. They had become strangers in the same house. America is no different. The children would assume what their parents were thinking, and the parents would assume what their children were thinking. Why? Because communication stopped. See, when you stop communicating, you begin to assume. When you stop communicating, some people take it upon themselves to assume or do without confirmation, proof, or anything else to assume what the other person's like. Assumption is terrible, and to call somebody an enemy is worse. These two elements together undo the fabric of a house, the bond of people, and it will cause you to look at your countrymen as something else. And once you see your neighbor as your enemy, your whole life changes. Why do you think people, even in the church, they can't trust one another? Why? What spirit is that? We have no major wars right now that we're in. We have relative peace, but we're causing issues ourselves because we're also opportunistic. And if we see somebody getting in the way of that opportunity, or if we see somebody stealing what we should have had, jealousy rises, everything else, in freedom. I'm telling you that many people don't know how to handle freedom. And it's up to those who are educated, who are tried and proven in areas of freedom to begin to instruct those who are not. It's in the church. It's in the homes. You know what the end result is? Murder. How many people have had their character murdered by somebody else for no apparent reason? How many have become targets inside the church of other people, inside the church for no apparent reason? They murder with the words, ruin people's lives in social media and otherwise. We have the same thing happening in the streets between citizens and law enforcement, government entities and the people, neighbor to neighbor, all because we don't know each other anymore. We have been entertained so long that we're believing the entertainment over reality and we're calling what we find in entertainment reality. We would rather read about you than to go and talk to you. That's a shame. People have become fearful of people. They're ready to demonize another person, but they're not ready to go and talk to them to find out what they're about, what their likes and dislikes are. A simple element in the professional fields. 
especially when you're dealing with uh, professionals who have arms, who are appointed over the public for the purpose of uh, uh, peacekeeping, it should be a mandate that they know their communities. Somehow the communities are going to have to get involved so they know every single officer on the force. Do you know that? Why hasn't that happened yet? Why doesn't the average neighborhood know every single officer on the force? You know how they go around campaigning for office, right? They're not afraid to stick a sign in your yard. If a peacekeeper is coming to your neighborhood, you need to know who the peacekeeper is. And that peacekeeper needs to know who you are. If they would add that element, that would change everything. And wouldn't you know it, it has happened overseas in a place that does not deal with this, not because of oppression, because law enforcement is like your neighbor. That's why it works so well. That same thing can be implemented here so that people know who their peacekeepers are. Do you know what happens when the people know who their peacekeepers are? They have a tendency and they start respecting one another mutually. They have a tendency to have lines of communication open and crime drops. Do you know why? Because somebody's always going to let one of those peacekeepers know who's fouled in the neighborhood. It's not going to be the case of criminals. Taking it for criminals, nope. It's going to be upstanding citizens with open communications to law enforcement, just like a neighbor. And that defeats a lot of crime. Crime depends upon the criminal not being seen. Crime depends upon the neighbor not having a good relationship with law enforcement or the peacekeepers of that place. Crime depends upon that. So imagine if your neighborhood had a good relationship with police officers. And indeed, that hurt happens in certain neighborhoods in the U.S. right now. Isn't that ironic? Those places don't see crime because the people know who their peacekeepers are and the peacekeepers know who the people are. And it's not some overwatch system. They're in a peacekeeping role. That's what they do. When it comes to a point where somebody is not obeying the law, do you not know the community? Becomes a deputy to help that person out before their record is torn to shreds. Do you know that happens all throughout America? But in the public side, in the neighborhoods where you have such a variety of ethnic backgrounds, the police officers don't know who the people are. And the people don't know who the police officers are. And what happens when you don't know somebody? Yet they've been appointed authority over you. I'll tell you what happens. You don't know what they're going to do. The police officers don't know what the citizens will do. And the citizens don't know what the police officer is going to do. And when that happens, they begin to assume. And when they assume, they're going to call somebody the enemy. And when they call somebody the enemy, it's going to be like a pressure cooker boiling. You see how simple that is? Right now, they're talking. And it took another person dying for them to talk. No, they don't. They're, they may not be doing it to each other's likings. But it always opens up lines of communication. And you know what happens every time this takes place. They begin to talk. Law enforcement talks with the people finally. The people find out who. They say, well, law enforcement is just like, you know, my neighbor. I thought they were all bad. I thought they all did this. Because believe it or not, people have that opinion. You have kids running around. They think all of law enforcement hates the youth. Do you know that? Because they have not spoken to them. And you have a lot of police officers thinking that entire neighborhoods are full of thugs. Because they have not spoken to them. They don't know each other. All of you who've been in the service, you've met a diversity of people. And you know for a fact that even some of the worst people can be your best allies. You know that. You know that open lines of communication and having somebody's back can change a life. You know what the Bible says, faith without works is dead. We can talk about this all night, but until it's implemented, nothing changes. Without these open lines of communication, I was listening to some of the, uh, some of the arguments on various news media outlets. Some of them are saying that these protesters are nothing more than thugs. That's not true. There are seven or eight groups mixed in together, and you have to be able to see who's doing what. You have a group setting fires. That's all they're doing. They don't care about anybody who dies at the hand of a police officer. All they want is to start some type of chaos. You have other groups who are hurting. You know why? They have been uh, criminalized where they shouldn't have been. They've been mistreated because they are people of color. That's something nobody should ever ignore. This country has a problem. What do you think in other countries right now? You know what they're doing in Germany? They're having protests. You know what they're doing in England? They were having protests. Do you know why? Because they go through the same thing with people who are prejudiced. And we shouldn't ignore that. If a bank alarm goes off, and if you saw an old lady walking across the uh, street, you wouldn't even look twice. Why would anybody do that? Because they know certain characters, but there's certain characters they know nothing about. And when you know nothing about a certain race or a certain color, nationality, whatever the case may be, you begin to assume. And when you assume, you become nervous. And when you become nervous, you make mistakes. All because you don't know the community. There has to be an extra measure, an, an effort for those professionals in uniform to have the community know them and so that they know the community that's missing. If that were opened up, what a world. Then your citizens would naturally start looking after them and
and vice versa. But most importantly, in every single case, crime falls away because they begin to see those who really start trouble. Now, again, we just went through COVID-19. Do you know what happens when people are told they have to stay indoors and their activities are limited? They have no outlet. Rome found that out a long time ago. So they had something called gladiators. They had the games. The reason why they had the games in the first place is because they knew that people would build up an emotional type of stress that they had to release. If they didn't release it, they wouldn't have had Rome. They had riots too. They wrote about those riots. They wrote about the protests. The same thing has been happening. The same thing is part of mankind. Now this has been happening a long time before America was ever thought about. Since that is the case, it is a natural part of the human experience. Because of that, we need a solution for it. It's something you can't ignore. It's part of our adaptation, part of our growth as societies. When you're having a lot of people work together, it can become quite confusing. So these steps ought not be ignored. There are certain individuals who will not settle for anything than the elimination of races. They're not changing from that position. Because of them, the citizens have to be a bit smarter knowing. There are people in society that think just like that. See, if we shy away from that subject, that subject stays hidden. And when it stays hidden, people become angry. And when people become angry and they have no outlet, it leads to a host of problems. A lack of communication is destroying us. People aren't looking out for each other anymore. They're looking sideways at one another. I, for one, I don't let situations like this cause any hatred in me. Here's why. If a person hates a specific type of individual or the way they speak or the way they act, it's going to cause them to act inflammatory against somebody else. If I get angry at that person and keep that anger, I'm no different than that inflammatory person. If one person does something out of anger, and I get angry at that person for doing it out of anger. Am I truly that different from the one who did it by that same power? No, I am not. Because believe it or not, when you're angry, you have to ask yourself something. I'm going to show you something about anger. Maybe you didn't know before. It's very simple. Anger is a state of mind you can be in, but anger should never be yours. It is only a state of mind where there's something you don't like. That's it. It's not some big deal. But when it's yours, that's when it begins to change you. Listen, un until when you lose somebody like that, just if, just as sure as you would lose somebody in your family over a doctor who took their heart out and they went in there for a cold. There have been mistakes like that in the medical field. If somebody did that to you, you would only think that you lost someone for no reason. You'd say, I lost my sibling, my, my spouse, my whoever it was. I lost them over somebody's negligence. And it would be very difficult to console you because your mind would be on losing someone for no reason. If someone warrants their own death, that's different. There is closure that can be had there. But if their death is not warranted, certainly if it's over something foolish, something that could have been avoided, it's very difficult to console a person that way. We assume so much, we even assume how much one person would love another. It's a sad thing. And again, we don't fight for one another. We are fighting one another. That's the big change in our society. Everybody has gotten used to fighting or competing with the other person to get everything they can get for themselves. And in the end, you mark my words, if people don't get rid of that mentality, maybe that's the reason in prophecy, Jerusalem is trampled underfoot for three and a half years, which means America is almost dissolved prior to that happening. I hope you can really understand that, that no one can go into Israel. No one can occupy that territory unless America is dissolved. And if America is dissolved, it did not happen overnight. It happened over the course of time. That's prophecy. That's not something that should be ignored. It's something you should be aware of. What happened in America that Jerusalem could be trampled underfoot three and a half years? What happened in America that we became so ineffective in the world? You might want to think about that. And what do you see out there happening now? What you're seeing on television is not the half of the story. It could be a little worse than what you think. So you have bad elements in the world. And these elements rise up during times just like these. And they will never stop doing what they can. And folks, prophecy is so clear, so incredibly clear. Brother turning against brother. Offense is in the land. Many will be offended. Many will hate one another. The love of many will wax colder and colder because iniquity abounds. That's what's happening here. To murder someone is iniquity. And because they get away with iniquity, the love of the protesters is waxing colder and colder. Can you see this in perspective? Which means if it's waxing cold, the restraint is going to ultimately go away. Do you, do you realize what I'm telling you? So long as these episodes keep happening in America. 
Right now they're having protests. They're trying their best to have a protest, but you have elements that have had enough, and they will never have a protest. In the Bible, it tells us this will spread the love of many waxing colder and colder because iniquity abounds. That means it's going to get worse, and you haven't seen anything yet. That means what people are going through today, they're being conditioned because it's about to get a lot worse. They're the first of many who are going to go through much, much worse. That's in prophecy. That's the bitterness of prophecy. Five years ago, you couldn't see it. You say, well, that would never take place. Well, those days are ending, have you noticed? You're trying to find out what part of prophecy you're in. And it's becoming bitter because now that you have to experience it, it's tearing people up. When you read something, you don't instantly believe it unless you have gone through some things. I know when I go through prophecy, I do instantly believe it because I'll never set myself up to ignore God's word again concerning his prophecies. But when most people read it, they don't connect with it. And then when things begin to happen, they slowly begin to put together the truth. The truth is where we are today. Today is not a lie. Today is the truth. What you thought today would be is the lie. What today is right now before your eyes is the truth. But the Lord was clear to tell us you would begin to see things. And when the Lord spoke, he spoke to the believers over more than one generation. He spoke to all who would believe. And he told us what to watch for. If you believe his writings, you become conditioned and you won't be lost in what's happening in the world. So that when something in the world happens like it happened a few days ago, you'll still stay full of faith, level-headed, full of hope, understanding what's going on, ready to console, praying for people, standing upright, not giving in, not becoming hopeless. That's what happens when you believe in the Lord's Word. You begin to see elements of His Word come to pass in your lifetime, and you'll teach somebody else, so somebody else will be ready. But the point is, you will not lose yourself in the process. These people who don't know God's Word, they'll have no answer for what's coming. God already said the prophets are going to have no answer for what's coming. That's what God said. People are going to find out they have been in great error in both their teaching, their learning, and their belief. God already said this, that these days would discover the error of man's belief. In other words, they would believe his word the wrong way. And when they would see it, that's the only thing that would straighten out their belief. See, he already said these things. He already said those who were prophets at that time, they're going to have no answer for what's taking place. Confusion of faces is going to belong to us. See, the Lord already said this, and he knew that we would go down the grapevine, mixing up his story, adding elements to it, thinking that we're right, prideful in our minds. And when things begin to unfold, they'll be so different from what most have accepted as truth that it will not be identified. A swipe on many will come upon them as a thief. For me, he will not come upon me as a thief because I stand ready right now today. Right now today, I'm ready. I've met the requirements. I didn't put anything off. I'm ready right now. And I'll be that way for the rest of my life. Every day of my life, I want to be ready. Do you know why? Because I know I do not have the keys of life and death. And if in five minutes I were to die, I know right now in my heart I did everything right before I got on air that I could do within my power for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ for my Lord and for my fellow man. I didn't hold anything back. I know I did my best and I gave my all. I'm going to be like that every day of my life. To watch is not to watch people. It's not to watch where the enemy is going. It's to stay in the truth and not waver. No excuses. It's to be a vessel of light in such a dark world. You can only do that being ready. And that requires every day of your life. Assumption is when you accept something to be true without checking or confirming it. A lot of assumption these days. People speaking as though things are true when they're not. That's exactly what the Lord spoke about, which would be the crux of many things that would take place in this hour. Christians need not be a part of that. True believers need not be a part of that. I'm not talking about going out there holding up peace signs. That's not what I'm saying. But get rid of assumptions. Stop trying to be the investigator and start trusting the word of the Lord. I need not investigate any of you. Do you know why? Because I know you're a sinner saved by grace. If I were to look for something from you, I would find sin. I already know you have sin. I have sinned too. I'm not interested in that. Not interested in what you did. But I will listen to what you believe and what you hope for. That's my interest, not what you've done, because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. So that makes investigations a bit foolish. What they hope for and what they believe tells you about the heart of a person. Many people don't know that. You want to get to know the heart of a person, ask them what they hope for. You'll see their hearts. I know what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for my brothers and sisters to make it. I'm hoping for a lot of people to make it in the kingdom of God. That's what I'm hoping for. That's why I do what I do. That's my hope. And I know they can't do it without the truth. You can only hope something like that if you believe the truth in the first place. That's why I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I never attempt to change it. I don't need to change this.
this piece and that piece. I don't need this piece and that piece explained and this, that, and the other because I'm not ashamed of it as it is. When the Lord said, love your enemy, he was telling us something. The only way you can love your enemy is for you not to have enemies. Someone may count you as an enemy, but you wouldn't dare count them as an enemy because you realize that your war is not against the flesh nor blood, but it's a spiritual fight. Therefore, you don't have enemies. You have adversaries, but humanity is not your enemy. You begin to realize that the one to your left and to your right is just like you are with a different hope. That's all. But the Lord gave us standards. And by and large, those standards, we really need them in the body of Christ. But most importantly, the world needs to see those standards, those who are crying and cannot be consoled. It takes young folks and you guys to change things. You can't ask somebody to change it for you. In fact, if you want change, you have to listen to your Lord. That's who has the answer. Your fellow man does not have the answer, or it would have changed. But today is the truth. Today is the truth of what we live in. We have such abilities. We should use them. You have an ability to put yourself in somebody else's place, somebody else's mindset. You have discerned capabilities and everything else. Bring them to bear so that hate never finds a home in you. Is anger different from hatred? You better believe it is. Hate is a weapon that has a target. Hate is not born of God. Hate is born of your adversary. Your adversary wants you to hate the one above and below you, the one beside you. And every time you do hate someone for whatever they did, I want you to recall something. What you have done in your life, somebody hated you for. But God forgave you of those things you did. Never forget that. Forgive those of what they have done so you can see beyond it. Don't look for the obvious. Stop looking for sin, but seek salvation. When you seek salvation, you'll learn to do good. And now what the Lord told his own people, learn to do good. You must learn to do good. All of us can do evil pretty good. We can do evil, you know, without even thinking about it. But we must learn to do good. We do good by listening to the source of good and truth, which is Christ. Because men do not have the answer. And that's where they err when they think they do. I hope that people develop strength because of what's happening in the world. I also hope that they gain some resolve and really consider that there is no solution in men. But in Christ, there is a solution. Not just in the Word of God, but in Christ Jesus. You can read the Word of God all you want, but if you're not positioned in Christ Jesus, the Word does not stand for you and it will not work for you. It will only stand as a warning against you or a witness against you. And sometimes the Lord can send somebody a vision or dream that's absolutely true to draw you away from Christ. You got to watch for those too. And the Lord said he does this to see if you love him with all of your heart and soul or not. So you're tested also to see if you love him with all your heart and soul by hearing things that may come to pass, but will ultimately draw you away from Christ Jesus. And people will say, hey, let's go worship other things. Let's go search out E.T. There are brothers. Yes, the Lord will test you like that and have evidence that whoever it is presenting this stuff will have evidence behind it. And they'll have a method behind what they can do. And the Lord says he allows this to see if you love him with all of what you are or not. Because if you love the Lord, then all things you're going to accept to follow are going to have to be of the Lord. In our case, it's going to be Christ Jesus or nothing at all. So if Jesus is not connected with it, we have no business following it. I'm not fooled by that word God. When people say, I believe, and they start talking about God, no. You mention the name Jesus Christ. It's dying on the cross, coming in the flesh, being resurrected. Now you're talking about somebody because that is the name we were given. We were given no other name. A person can use that word God all day. That is not a name. That's a designation for an entity. That's a designation. That's a title. That is not a name. But when they use Jesus of Nazareth, that, that's something totally different.